courage and a lot of negotiations in order, you know, to f promote, you know, uh, free trade agreement, intra-regional trade. Uh, and, and I think uh, also there is one key uh, thing that I wanted to bring uh, here is uh, the business actors. Do they know about the free trade agreement? I'm sure there are a lot of actors who have no mere knowledge about the opportunities and about the challenges of the uh, free trade agreement. So what are the uh, measures that are done at the procedural level, at the administrative level, at the technical level to accompany uh, African investors in order to implement this uh, free trade agreement? Thank, uh, thank you, Karima. Now let me bring in uh, Mr. Taylor. European Union, what lessons can the continental free trade area learn from the European Union, especially with Brexit uh, going out? We've seen what's been happening since uh, they uh, voted to stay out of the European Union. So many challenges. But sometimes when I reflect, I say, oh, if they had told the British people that this will happen, or if they have another referendum tomorrow, they may say, no, leave us there. But I, I'm not from the UK, so I don't know. So you give us your own perspectives. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, one of the speakers uh, during Google messages earlier here this morning uh, said that until the lion tells his story, the story will always be told by the hunter. I think he was speaking to me. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you what lessons you should learn. I think you are very distinguished guests here from the African Union and so on. I think you, you will learn your own lessons. What, what, I can, what I can share with you is some of the experiences that we have seen in the European Union. And from that, you will learn all your own conclusions. But let's start with Brexit. It's a mess. It's also a, a proof that if you don't bring everybody along in the journey with you, there will be people that will be dissatisfied and they will even shoot themselves in the feet because they're unhappy. I don't think anybody now that follows the Brexit story can really see what the advantage is for the majority of the people in Britain from leaving uh, a very well-established trading pattern. But it's so ingrained in there now that the decisions are taken which will have an impact. We've seen in the press here in Nigeria that there will be an economic impact here. That may be exaggerated for the media, uh, but we know even within the EU that investors, they like stability. And when you have an unstable situation like the Brexit talks, it leads to disturbances of the market, and that has a negative impact on the economy. And that will be felt even as far away uh, as Nigeria. Um, when people talk about the consequences of the Brexit here, my personal belief is that it will not have such an impact on a country like Nigeria uh, in terms of its trade with, with Europe. But there are other countries in Africa uh, that have preferential trade agreements, our famous economic partnership agreements, where that trade will be affected enormously. Where you have countries, for example, in Southern Africa, that sent most of their exports to Europe via the UK. From day to day, if there is a no deal Brexit, that preferential trade pattern will be cut off. And that has enormous consequences. Now, what does that say for the, the African free trade area? It shows that if you don't have the preferential trade regime, trade is much more difficult. And when you establish a successful trade it really links everybody very closely together. And the whole problem with Brexit, in fact, is how to unravel that relationship in a sensible way. And I think there it's not necessarily a lesson for you, but it is certainly something that your heads of state and your negotiators really need to take on board. How far are you prepared to close, close up your relationship? How, how far are you prepared to give up sovereignty to build that trading relationship? I think in Nigeria, there is a very open debate about that. Um, whether it's trade relations with the EU or within ECOWAS or at the level of the European Union. But 
there's no free dinner here. If you want a preferential trade regime, which will have overall positive benefit for uh, the economies of the African states, there is a price to pay at that point. And that starts off with your own sovereignty. But that's a whole other area of discussion. I understand where you're coming from, <laughs> but we'll see if we can interrogate that further. Senator so, Shehusani, what do you have to say? Especially you that have the CSO's background. That, um, um, I also do know that even as we pursue after, uh, it also has to be domesticated. Our national assemblies or our parliaments will need uh, to work on it. Do you think that perhaps, because I've also heard different thoughts from different divides. No, we don't support after. For example, I was speaking with a senator, was it two weeks ago? Nancy, how can you be supporting this? I said, Senator, I'm not one of the leaders that went to do the stuff. He was of the view. No, you see what is happening? Nigeria may just be the Brexit for after. So it, it got me thinking that perhaps do we have everyone on board, especially from the parliament and also the, uh, the CSOs, which you were part of before you entered the Nigerian Senate. Thank you very much. Well, all has been said, a lot has been said about the African trade free area. But I think what we need to remind ourselves is that the idea of integrating the continent economically is not a new one. It is imbibed in the articles and the clauses and writings, and statements of our founding fathers in Africa. Go through the writings and speeches of the Heli Selassie, Kwame Nkrumah, Nambi Azikwe, Ahmed Sekoturi. You can see how they succinctly predicted that our future as a continent is tied to each other. So the idea of an African free trade area came after we have come to the realization that all that we have attempted to do in the last five decades have failed. In the last five decades, we have seen how we struggle to find our footings and future by relationships that are outside of the continent. We try our marriages with the island, it failed. The World Bank failed. And some of our Francophone allies, too, align themselves with France, thinking that all will deliver the, the future they so desire. So the idea of an African free trade area is coming back to that very reality that our destiny and our future is time to each other. But there are challenges that we have to be ready to face. One of which is the one we are experiencing in the country today. You can't sign an African free trade area then close your borders. I don't know how to call black white. That is my word. And you also have to tell yourself the truth that if we are desirous of building a new economic future for our continent, then we have to sacrifice some of our irrelevant relationships with nations that are outside of our country. And on this, I believe that signing is one thing, and following to the latter, all the requisites of those papers we sign is another. So I believe a conversation like this will ignite and encourage those who are empowered with the givers of power to see to it that those things we have signed on paper come to life. Thank you, Mr. Now, I would.
give Dr. Dibbo a little respond because you came in and you came out to face the government of Nigeria to say, why close your borders when we've signed the African Continental Free Trade Area? Like I said in my opening speech, this is an African family meeting. Let's talk to ourselves. Dr. Dibbo, why are the borders closed? And the president has said it will be open in 2020. It will be close till 2020. Just to say that that statement to the customs service and they denied it. But it's a very good question. But I have a very straightforward answer. The simple answer, the very simple one, which is not relevant, but I cannot resist saying it, is that we have signed, we have not ratified. But more importantly, the AFCFTA is trying to introduce a rules-based trading system in Africa. Now, the very people who have already signed previous agreements with Nigeria on customs cooperation, on the rules that will affect transit of goods, are not living to those obligations. So, you are not following on the things you have signed to but you want to hold me on to the things I have just signed to. So what you will then have is that I will sign on to the AFCFT and you will continue to do these things you are doing to undermine my economy, smuggling, dumping. You will continue to do them because I have signed the AFCFT. But you have not recognized the agreements, the various agreements that we have signed under ECOWAS, under the Cotonou uh, Agreement, I think it is, that regulates the trade between us and our neighbors. You have not signed on to them. You signed on to them, but you are not observing them. But now you are asking me to observe you own. So I think it's a very good opportunity for us to remind everybody that all obligations should be adhered to. How do you explain? And I really don't want to use the example because of my background, but I have to. How do you explain the situation in which Nigeria increased tariffs on rice in 2013? And since then, the exports of rice to Benin are 500% since 2013 of parboiled rice which they do not eat. How do you explain that Benin, with a population that cannot compete with my hometown, exports the second highest importer of rice after China? How do you explain the situation in which there are agreements that have been signed? It's not the first time the border has been closed. President Thomas Sanjo closed the border. Then they came to the table, signed the agreement with us, and observed that agreement. Then after a while, they dropped the agreement. So it, I think it's an opportunity for us to say that when you sign up to things, let us all observe what we sign up to. And let it not only be that when we show you that there can be a reaction, that you now say that you signed it. We are not observing the rules. One of the ones you signed up to, you are not observing yourselves. I think we must tell ourselves the truth in Africa. We sign for rule based uh, trade, we must observe rule based trade. The beauty for me of the AFCFTA is that, in addition to those rules on customs cooperation, those rules on transit management, there is a dispute settlement mechanism. ECO was still having a dispute settlement mechanism of that sort. But I should be able to go somewhere and say, you are undermining my economy. Which country in the world, anybody in the audience that's willing to take on, allows people to dump into their economy and just say we're happy? Where? There must be some sense of national uh, interest in our relationship with other states, no matter how much you love the Pan African and you know, the Pan African I, I mean, so that's the point. So I, 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 I love trade, I know trade leads to growth, but we're now talking about the establishment of a rule based trading system. And so we must all observe the rules and not just call only on Nigeria to observe the rules. Okay, uh, Dr. Dipo, the one I will just take in summary, I'm going back to my science background. One of the forces in physics, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So perhaps that's it from Nigeria. Uh, Senator Shitani, I don't know if that's from Dr. Dipo who answers your question. I'll go back to you a bit. Uh, Professor Jerome. Um, what we are talking about now is one of the challenges, Nigeria closing its borders and saying for other countries that are bordered with Nigeria, for us to have rules, rules based uh, uh, trading system. But what other challenges are we seeing with the CFTA that may likely come? 
especially even as we see the European Union as uh, the only example right now that we're seeing. What are the challenges and what are the solutions to those challenges quickly? Uh, thank you, Nancy. I think uh, added to the point you have made about the uh, border closure, you should add the xenophobia in South Africa. <laughs> and these are some of the biggest countries in uh, Africa. This is the reality of the situation. Um, before we engage in this uh, over celebratory mode, I normally remind the people, I mean, to go back to their international economics class. I mean, we used to teach you in the same department. Uh, free trade is one of the several stages as you move towards the government. It is just number two after Professor uh, Trade Agreement. You still have sequential series of stages. Customs union from here you move to common market, then from common market to economic union, where the EU is now. Uh, then if you take would like what uh, uh, the East African community wants, they want to have a political union, then you have a political union. Before finally you get to uh, the complete economic integration. So it's good to celebrate what stage two is not uh, good enough. But if you look at the different regs, there was a very important question you asked. I mean, it's not all the regs are not at the same level. On behalf of Africa, Africa Consultancy Building Foundation, I actually led a team of consultants to visit all the regs to assess what they are and their capacity imperatives. Many of them don't have the requisite capacity. The most successful now is the East African community. They are doing very well. ECOWAS is number two. You find that ECOWAS has even surpassed the stage where we are now, which is the free trade. They already the aspect of custom union. But why is it that fundamentally very many of these regs are not working? The major aspect is finance. Our heads of states are not paying their bills. And there are many reasons for that. The first is multiple membership. You have something called the spaghetti bowl. If you look at the way uh, African countries are members of international economic communities. And in Kenya, this is the fact. Kenya is a member of five out of the eight recognized uh, regs. So what part of what this free trade agreement will do is to help us harmonize and remove the distortions. But there are a number of disadvantages or challenges along the line. Let me just list them. The first one is that if you look at uh, what has actually registered trade in Africa. Tariff is just one of the obstacles, but they are not the major ones. The major ones are non-tariff barriers. I'm happy that our military people are here. Just take a trip to Benin Republic. There are at least about 18 different checkpoints here. There is no way this one is going to stop. It can only improve. But those are the major challenges which you have to counter followed with the lack of infrastructure. Free trade is not going to solve your infrastructure problems. Like I mentioned earlier, if you look at a map of Africa, I mean, 16 countries are trying and landlocked, which means they are not linked to the sea. Because about 80% of uh, trade in Africa, or I think 90%, is carried by sea, maritime, which is where the seas are very important. You find Bobasa and others serving the other ports. But there is a lot of inefficiency in these ports. The only port that is efficient in Africa is the Durban port in, Africa, in South Africa. Even then, Durban port is one of the most expensive ports in the whole world. So there are several challenges you have to counter. Only 20% of our roads are paved. So how are you going to compete? And even when you talk of uh, free trade, we we'll try to look at the composition of trade by Africans. You find that invariably the trade is going to be in processed products. Because currently, we are spending about $63 billion to import food, what we can do in Africa. But many of these food imports, they are processed foods. So if you are going to have a share of the market, you have to find a way to produce. The supply side factors are very, very important. If you don't produce, there's no way you can compete. And in the case of Nigeria, there's no way you can compete by producing with generators. So you need to really sit tight and find out what I can take about it. Uh, the final obstacle, the 
major challenge that Goto measured is uh, uh, some of the factors, I mean, the political factors that are related to its trade. I mean, the leadership. You find that a situation where many of them come to the African Union, very good deliberation, they cite those things and they forget about them. There is no way these things are transmitted to the country. There is a white gulf. I work with the African Union, but I will tell you the truth. We we'll be to the European Union, they do this properly. At African Union, there is no way for you to sit and ask yourself the decisions that were taken last year, how many of them have been implemented. So that was why some of us who say there should be a moratorium, no more conferences, no more seminars. Just go and implement what you've agreed before. Africa will move forward. <laughs> Perhaps you just ended our session. Let's go now. <laughs> but um, you said a lot of critical things. And even as you enumerated the challenges, you've also given the solutions. We must get our infrastructure right. We must get our policies right. And Kariba did say something, not political will, but political courage. You know, not just political will. Let me tell you this, one, the, our experience as we are planning this uh, conference for those three days. Um, of course, we expected a lot of delegates from other African countries, like the Kenya High Commissioner told you. The Deputy President of Kenya was supposed to be here with us today, if not of states' uh, uh, events. One of our delegates from Kotonou was supposed to come here. And when we were, okay, perhaps my partner told you, the ticket from Kotonou to this place, just guess, close to 500,000 men. Just Kotonu. Kotonu here. Yes. 500,000 naira to come to Nigeria. So when my partner told me, I was like, I was so infuriated that it's even costlier to come from Kotonu than to come from US or the UK. So are we really serious? Karima, please. <laughs> Yeah, I heard about it and uh, I think this is one of the issues not only business uh, people are facing but I think all uh, the different actors and stakeholders are facing to come to Africa and I want, want to raise your attention about two important messages here. First of all is mobility. We're talking about free trade agreement, we're talking about economic partnership but we're putting a lot of obstacles in terms of goods and services and also equal mobility. So, first of all, you talked about the uh, closing of borders. How would we do a free trade agreement if, because of the so many conflicts between different African countries, they're closing borders? This is an important problem. And also, uh, we've been uh, hearing a lot of uh, initiatives, nice initiatives like African passports, visa facilitations, regional passports, but unfortunately, these initiatives have stayed in political discourse, but not translated into political actions. And from here, I would like to pledge uh, an important um, request to sign a one million uh, signature petition to reduce the tariffs of airlines because it is part of the African Union 2063 agenda and you know it is very shameful that in some destinations regardless of the efforts that have been done by certain airlines that we have to travel to another continent to come to Africa and then we have to pay a, a, you know, an imaginary cost of money, you know, to travel into African countries. So this is really a pledge that we have to advocate for changing uh, these policies. Uh, second, I think, uh, the, the, in terms of the capacity building, uh, I think this free trade agreement should benefit small medium enterprises. What have we prepared for them? To enter new markets, to face the, the economic giants, and uh, at the same time to survive the, com the competition. Uh, this is first, because I think we are today in the age of digitalization, artificial intelligence, monetary transformation, the rise of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, etc. So what are we doing uh, in terms of that? And the last point that I wanted to bring here is about the increase of taxation 
of goods and services. There are many uh, small and medium enterprises who are, you know, exporting to African countries, but then actually now they have to stop because of the increase of taxation. The last point is the local products. What are we doing to, to, uh, to develop value chains, to valorize our local products? If we want to have African solutions, African trades done by Africans with Africans, we have to start, start doing policies and strategies to valorize our local products. Uh, Mr. Tello, tell the European uh, Union, of course, is the world's most deeply integrated single market we're seeing right now, if not of the Brexit issue uh, that you're seeing. How did you get to that point of uh, integration? And of course, just like Professor Sir Jerome had said, there are different stages. The EU is, of course, at the economic union. There are a lot of stages, the customs union and all of that. How did you get to that point that uh, the EU is the mostly integrated single market right now uh, in the world? Perhaps if the CFTA is done, we will definitely overtake you. <laughs> know that from just after the Second World War, so back in the late 1940s, the early 1950s, which is 70 years ago now, they started talking about uh, what we now call the European Union. The first thing we had was a customs union. Now, full disclosure to the audience today, I am a customs officer, or I used to be, so that's, that's where I come from. <clears throat> so I'm very proud to say that the whole European Union is very much based on a customs now, if you want to read that across to the African uh, free trade area, that's, that is your starting point. Are you prepared in Africa to go that far? When you talk to the African Union, there are all sorts of policy areas which leads to things like the Customs Union. But it's a very big step. In my opening intervention, I talked about the, the political will, the loss of sovereignty. For the, for the European Union to have a customs union, it meant that trade policy left capitals and went to Brussels. Right? It's very difficult for people outside Europe maybe to understand the, the effect of that. But if we go back to the Brexit story, we have a situation where one of our member states, the United Kingdom, has not had to negotiate trade agreements or trade matters since it joined the European Union. And now, they have to develop that, that expertise all over again. And it has a massive impact. So, the, the, the lessons, or the, the, uh, the way we did it in Europe, is we started with the Customs Union. And all these other uh, initiatives to bring our citizens closer together came from that starting point. The, the other element I think I should share with you, but again, I don't know how it brings across to, to the Africans, is what we have done uh, for our, let's say, our uh, vulnerable regions. We have a regional policy in Europe. In other words, money goes into Brussels, and then it is shared out to the poorer communities. Again, if you look at the UK, it's my pet subject of the there are parts of the UK that are much wealthier than others. Of course, the southeast of England, with its banking and everything else, is very wealthy. But there are other parts of the UK which are much poorer, like Scotland, and they have benefit, benefited significantly from regional funds. And that brings me back to the, to the element I tried to, to highlight at the start. If you don't bring everybody along that journey, you will have dissatisfaction. If you have countries in Africa that are benefiting very well from the free trade arrangement, but you have other countries that are not benefiting, you will not have a successful outcome. And when you have a situation, as we've heard, in Nigeria, where you are suggesting that other countries are not following the rules, of course that is a problem as well. In the EU, we are very strong advocates of rules-based trade. We are very strong advocates of the WTO. I know that may not be quite so popular in Africa. I see my colleague smiling beside me. All right. But for us in the EU, we believe that trade can only work properly 
and fairly if there are based on rules that are agreed by, by everybody in the system. And when you look at the African free trade area, you have a wonderful opportunity there to develop your own rules. I know that you're still working out the details of things like rules of origin, the market access offers from one country to another. But it's incredibly important there. I mean, you already talked about dispute settlement, I think, earlier this morning. But for me, what's really important is that you have sufficient measures on safeguards. So, you, talk, you talked about SMEs, right? You have to protect, protect your SMEs. If somebody in this country launches a product, product a new product, but can't compete even on its own market because of cheap imports, it's never going to get good. And in most trade agreements, certainly all the trade agreements that the EU has signed up to, we always have safeguard measures in place. I've, I've come from Southern Africa where we have uh, a trade agreement between the EU and the SADC the uh, countries. And there, there are several safeguard measures precisely to protect the African SMEs to develop their products. And I think that is something that you must have inside your own trade area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, our sixth panelist is here, Dr. Imasen. Uh, Dr. Imasen is a lecturer at Bayes University. Abuja. Please, a round of applause as he joins us uh, at the podium. While he uh, takes time to settle down, let me come to Senator Shehu Sadi. Um, can all uh, African countries compete equally? Because if you're looking at even the African continent right now, you are talking of not more than five, six economies. In fact, if you're talking about two, perhaps Nigeria uh, as the biggest economy on the continent and South Africa as the most advanced and industrialized uh, uh, country on the African continent. You're also taking a look at parts like Egypt and all of that. And like I said in my opening speech, we have about five to six fastest growing economies in the world here in Africa. So it beats me really why all this uh, pervasiveness of hunger, uh, poverty and all of that, still, you know, uh, we're still colored by it. With this CFTA, can all African countries compete equally then? And Equatorial Guinea, for example, will not feel threatened um, with Nigeria. Um, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that there is a difference between richer countries converging and poorer countries converging. When richer countries converge is to preserve their wealth and become rich. When poor countries converge to see how they can escape from poverty, at the same time protect their economy. Now it is the idea of the free trade area is to, I believe, address some of these differences within ourselves. And the pessimistic aspect of it was the revelation made by my brother here, how leaders converge in Addis Ababa and have problems later in terms of implementation of those agreements they signed. So on this, I believe that if the follow-up committee that was set up by the free, free trade area can work assiduously on this. Uh, first and foremost, institutions like the Customs, Immigration, the Drug Law Enforcement Agencies, and other security apparatus of the states that are at the borders, if they can be well funded and equipped, I believe some of these fears we have raised as far as free trade zone can be squarely addressed. I 
insisted that in as much as we want to protect our economy, we always have to put consideration to the importance of our own neighbors. I know we lock down our economy with borders for rights. But our neighbors in the Northeast are suffering from problems that come from our country. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of our people are in the Cameroon, they are in Chad, they are in Niger Republic. So, if for your rights they send back those people down here, how are you going to feel? <laughs> Neighborliness has its own imperatives. Small scale industries need to be protected. But I believe the rules that are there in the free trade zones makes provision to ensure that some of these institutions of the state takes care of this. For the poorer countries in Africa, I believe this is an opportunity for them to also see how this kind of cooperation could uplift their own status from what they are. The sub-regional bodies, the ECOWAS, the SADC, and the East African Community have their own challenges, but to a greater extent, they have also worked. And they have been able to do what they can. It's better than not having them. So the zero point about all that we are discussing here is on how religiously we can implement. I've seen the documents of after. How that can be implemented will be dependent on an efficient custom and immigration service, well funded and well equipped to work. No matter what we do, as far as those institutions are where they are, will simply be wasting our time. On another point is that there is a resurgent interest in Africa by nations of the world. Today we are in Japan, Russia, China, and I have learned that Qatar and Turkey are planning to invite us to come and discuss. I think we need to understand that the urgent love and interest in Africa is about themselves, not about us. So the issue before us is how do we utilize this new opportunity for our own self? If we are invited, we need to go with a workable agenda. If you go to Russia, you are signing with a Russian government for two to three thousand kilometers of railway. There is an African proverb that says, if someone is giving you something, you look at what he has. Is that feasible? Is that possible? So I think if we are to make good use of this new interest in Africa. We should also key it to after. We need to come, despite the fact that we are a continent of country, we still have our own individual peculiarities and interests. But this is important that before we attend any meeting being called by any country, there's first of all the need for the leaders to meet within themselves. Now come out with a position that this is what we actually want. If we are not careful, nations like Tahiti will start inviting all of us.
<laughs> and we go there, we sit down, the televisions are there for two, three days, and then we come back and nothing changed. It is a shame to see as a continent today, thousands of our people are crossing the Sahara to Libya and drowning in the Mediterranean Sea their attempt to search for greener pasture in Europe. We, I don't know what the African Union is doing, but I've seen the EU having more interest in this issue because they are at the civic end of this people. So let us save a date. Meeting in Japan, in Brazil, let us, let African leaders at least try to summon the courage to meet in Libya and address the problem of these thousands of our young people that have a lot to deliver to our country.